All right, good evening and welcome to Genomics Light. Um, this is our session um, in the lab with our Welcome Genomes and Campus researchers. So my name's Em and I'm the Education and Learning Officer for the Welcome Genome Campus. And we've got a few people joined on our call today that I'll get to introduce uh, in just a second. So we've got Fran, who's the Education and Learning uh, Manager for the Welcome Genome Campus. She's sort of hiding in the background and between the two of us, we're gonna make sure everything runs smoothly today. Um, and we've also got our two speakers with us as well. So we have um, Emma Carpenter and Francois. Sorry, I lost where you are on screen and I'll get you to both introduce yourselves uh, as well. So Emma, do you want to introduce yourself? Yep. Hi everyone. My name is Emma. I am a third year PhD student at the Wellcome Inst uh, Sanger Institute and I work on malaria. Awesome. And Frank? Um, yeah, my name is Frank Schwach. Uh, I've been at the Sanger Institute for 10 years now. I'm a staff scientist um, and I'm not actually in the lab anymore. I do bioinformatics. I'll show you later what that actually means. Awesome. So you'll see um, obviously more from them in just a second. Um, in case anyone hasn't used Zoom before um, or Zoom webinar even, you might spot it's a little different from a normal Zoom meeting. So you can't use your camera or your microphone today. So if you need to talk to us, ask us anything. Um, and if we need you to answer questions for us, there's a few different ways that we're going to do that. There's a chat box that's like down that way. So in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and basically, you can say hello to us. Um, and if you've got any uh, technical issues, if for whatever reason, you're having issues with the webinar, you can uh, leave us a question there and me and Fran will try and help you. Um, and if you've got any general um, sort of questions about the campus or about these sessions, pop those in the chat as well. There's two other bit buttons that you'll spot at the bottom of your screen. Um, so we have the uh, Q&A function that's like two little speech bubbles. So if you've got any sort of sciencey questions for our speakers today, pop them in the Q&A because it makes us a lot easy, easier to, to find them when we're looking for questions a little bit later. We've also got polls, so they'll jump up on your screen like a little quiz. And so sometimes we might ask you questions as we go through the session, um, but they should all jump up on the screen. So before I hand over to our speakers, I'm going to show you a little bit more about the campus and our work before I hand over to them. So I'm going to try and share my screen again. So hopefully you can see my screen. See my slide? Awesome, I'm seeing some nods for my panel. Um, so this is our second in our series of infectious disease workshops uh, with our campus researchers. We've got two more sessions coming up in the next couple of weeks, um, both on pretty exciting topics as well. So there'll be more information about how to sign up for those uh, in the chat box uh, in a second. Um, this is the campus. So I know we've got quite an international audience with us today. So in case you've not seen the campus before, this, this is the campus. Um, we're based just outside of Cambridge in England, so around here on this map. But actually, we've got a quite international staff base. Um, and I currently live in Scotland. So um, we're based all over the place. And actually, I wonder if anyone is based further from campus than I am right now. So in the chat box, if you're happy to pop where you're from, we've got some already, and we'll see if anyone can beat me. Uh, they definitely Definitely can. I can see some pretty far reaching audiences already. So we've got Germany, we've got uh, where else? We've got Canada. Okay, that's doing pretty well. Our uh, Carnoustie up the road for me. Um, we've got Surrey, we've got Wakefield, quite a lot of in the UK, a few of oh, North, uh, North Carolina, that might win. Um, so yeah, we've got a pretty international cohort and we've got a pretty international audience as well today, which is pretty cool. On the campus then we've got two main uh, research institutes. We've got the Welcome Sanger Institute, which is where both of our speakers are from today. And we've got EMBL EBI. The EBI bit stands for European Bioinformatics Institute. So this group is all based around data, whereas the Welcome Sanger is a mix of what we would call a wet lab and uh, data as well. And we'll see a bit of both of those today. Both groups and all the other groups on the campus are interested in genomics, hence the Welcome Genome Campus. And genomics is broadly the study of uh, the, an organism's genetic materials. So I know that the word genome, not everyone may have heard of. So I'm gonna pop off a quick poll just to see who's in our, uh, who's in our audience today and how confident you feel with genomics. You might not feel you know anything and that's absolutely fine. That's why we're here. I don't think I'd heard of the word genomics when I was at school. Um, so there's a little poll. It should jump on pop on your screen um, and hopefully you'll be able to fill that in. 
got a big bit of a mix then. Lots of people would say that their genomics knowledge is sort of middling. We've got some that haven't heard of it much at all, which is absolutely fine. That's why we're running these sessions so that people can find out more. Awesome. On the campus, we've got quite a little lot of different research happening. So we do research around human genetics, around cancer, around cellular genetics, around parasites and microbes, around the tree of life, which is understanding how stuff is related to each other um, and around biodata as well. Obviously today we're looking at malaria, so that'll come under our parasites and microbes sort of area of research. Before I hand over to our speakers then, I'll just signpost a couple of things that might be particularly interesting to anyone studying for like GCSEs, A-levels, that type of level of uh, stuff at school. We have our Your Genome website, which is full of uh, articles, activities and resources to help you study anything to do with genomics. You can sign up for our education update, um, which will tell you whenever any, ever we run a session like this, and you can connect with us on social media as well. And I'll pop all these uh, things in the chat box in just a second. So I think that's all I wanted to uh, talk about before handing over to our speakers. So I'll stop sharing the screen and I will pass over to Emma. I think you're on mute there, Emma. There we go. <laughs> Minor technical glitch. Hi, everyone. Um, now I hope you can you can see uh, my blank screens at the moment. Uh, but thank you very M much, M, for the uh, um, introduction. So I'm going to be talking about malaria in the lab. Um, so, um, as I said at the beginning, I'm a PhD student, I work on malaria, I study malaria, um, but um, we're just going to start the session off with, a, with a, an interesting question. So here on this slide, I have um, a picture of, of two people. Uh, the one on the left is Abraham Lincoln, and the one on the right is Alexander the Great. And I have a question for you, which is, um, what on earth do these two people have to do with malaria? So hopefully M has popped up a poll. Yep, there we go. Um, and you can... Um, have your best guess to why on earth I'm talking about these two people during a talk on malaria. The little poll should have popped up on your screen, but I know that sometimes if you're using a mobile, it won't. So you can always write uh, any answers in the chat instead. But it looks like most people think that both of them had malaria. A few people think that they might have studied malaria and a few people think they might have been credited with naming the disease. But yeah. Um, um, well, um, as a uh, but many of you did get right. Um, it is actually the case that both Alexander the Great and Abraham Lincoln both had malaria. Uh, Lincoln actually had it twice, um, but it did not kill him. Um, the malaria disease has been around as long as we have. It's decimated armies, um, and it hasn't only just affected people of the past. Some of you may know um, Cheryl Tweedy. She went to um, Tanzania um, in 2010. And when she was there, she actually um, became uh, ill with, uh, with what turned out to be malaria, and she was even hospitalized for this. Um, but luckily, she got um, the treatment she needed and she made a full recovery. And then some of you may know as well, back in 2018, um, there were these sweet little penguins at Exmoor Zoo, which is actually quite near where I grew up. Um, and these sweet little penguins just all dropped dead um, over a couple of days. And it was because they all had contracted uh, bird malaria. Um, and the, the thought was that um, perhaps some birds who were migrating from another country had brought uh, the disease over and these poor penguins had, uh, had no chance of fighting off, uh, fighting off this disease. Um, but it's not really animals, well, animals do can contract malaria, they can contract their own versions of malaria, but in terms of people, it's not just celebs and people of the past who get malaria. Most of you have probably heard malaria because it affects a lot of people in um, countries um, that are equatorial, in particular in sub-Saharan Africa. So over, there are over 200 million cases of malaria per year, most of them children um, under the age of five, um, and that's unfortunately where most of the deaths happen. Almost, almost half a million people die every year of malaria. Um, and what does malaria look like as a disease? Well, it's almost like you have a really bad case of flu, headaches, muscle pain, fatigue, um, you get these very strange periodic fevers and chills, like every 48 hours you get a fever and then it goes down again and then it comes back. 
Um, and then eventually um, your, the blood vessels in your brain can become damaged in very severe cases of malaria and that can lead to coma and death. Um, so this is a, an awful disease and we want to get rid of it. Um, and so you may have heard of the malaria in the news. Um, it's not really something that affects, um, well, of course we have a very international audience, but me living in the UK and many of our viewers, um, we're not really worried about getting malaria. Um, in fact, we might not even really know what it is. Malaria is the disease, but what causes malaria? So I have another question for you. Um, what causes malaria? Is it bacteria? Is it viruses? Is it uh, the mosquito? Or is it something else? A little poll should have popped up or right in the chat. What yep, so we've got quite a lot of answers. Um, fairly, sp we've got answers across all four, but mainly split between mosquito and something else. Mm. Yes, that'll be because I asked you a bit of a mean trick question because it's not a bacteria, it's not a virus, and it's not the mosquito, it's something else. So um, malaria is actually caused by a little single-celled creature called plasmodium. So it's a living thing, um, but it's, it doesn't belong to the bacterial or the virus um, domains of life. Um, it's actually it's all a, a unique thing all on its own. Um, and it's, uh, it's called plasmodium. Um, but the mosquito is not entirely blameless. You might think, oh, hang on, I'm sure mosquitoes have got something to do with malaria. And, and that's true, they do. Um, mosquitoes are actually the most deadly animal in the entire world because they transmit so many different diseases. I'm just gonna show you now um, how the mosquito is involved um, in the life cycle of the malaria parasite. So um, we take the beginning of this life cycle first, a person is bitten by an infected mosquito. Um, and the mosquito um, has parasites in its mouth parts and it spits them into your body when it takes a blood feed. So these are these little plasmodium parasites that are being essentially injected into your body. It takes about two hours for those parasites to make their way to your liver. And once in the liver, they make more and more copies of themselves. So those doing GCSE A level, they, they're doing mitosis, they're doing asexual reproduction. They're just making copies of each other um, just to amplify their numbers. Um, and at that stage, there are no symptoms, like nothing uh, seems wrong uh, with you, um, apart from that you got bitten by a mosquito a couple of hours ago. So this happens over a course of a couple of weeks. And um, then, um, once these parasites have amplified themselves so huge numbers, they burst out of the liver and they enter the bloodstream. Um, and this is where the symptoms start, start to occur. Um, a single parasite will physically push itself into a red blood cell. Well, the red blood cells, as many of you know, are the cells that transport oxygen around the body and they're filled with hemoglobin and not much else. Um, but a single parasite will push its way into a red blood cell, will physically push itself in. And then this cycle occurs. So this cycle, um, uh, con uh, consists of the parasite um, eating all the hemoglobin essentially inside the red blood cell, breaking it down, um, using up a lot of nutrients. And then um, with those nutrients, it starts to make more copies of itself. Again, asexual reproduction, mitosis, um, until the red blood cell is so full of parasites that it can't sustain it, stay in it anymore. And those parasites burst out of the red blood cell um, and they release all these tiny little parasites that then infect fresh red blood cells. And so you can see the cycle just goes on and on. Um, because, um, so the, the length of the cycle is about 48 hours. And that explains why we get these periodic fevers and chills, which is very um, uh, evident that you have a malaria infection because every 48 hours you get this huge release of parasites into your bloodstream and your, your immune system um, panics and that's why you get a fever and then it dies down and then you get another fever spike. Um, so this is where most of the damage is happening and it's making you feel absolutely rubbish. So how does the parasite then get out of the human again? Um, so parasites do have an escape strategy. Um, they make male and female forms of themselves instead of completing a cycle they'll sort of die off this path. And then when a mosquito bites a sick person, they will take up the male and female forms of the parasite. And then within the mosquito, um, sexual recombination will take place, meiosis. Um, and within two weeks, uh, the next time a, a mosquito bites a person, it will release the parasites and it will restart this cycle. So it's quite a weird, complicated life cycle with a liver stage, a blood stage. It's, it's in a human, but also a mosquito. And it, and it really requires um, this, uh, this tight um, relationship between humans and mosquitoes. Um, but 
um, hopefully many of you in the audience have never had malaria, um, but it is a problem. So who, who is living with malaria? Now, this uh, map uh, shows where malaria is and where it used to be. So the purple areas of the map, um, which are uh, kind of the equatorial re regions, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, South America, Southeast Asia, India, um, these are the places where malaria still um, is a problem. Um, but if you look at the orange, like where I, where I am in Cambridge, um, Cambridge used to have malaria only 100 years ago, in the 1900s, there was still malaria knocking about. So my next question for all of you is, how did we eliminate malaria in the orange regions? We don't have it anymore. Why? So um, the pop-up has hopefully appeared for you guys. We'll pop in the chat what your best guess is. We got quite a lot of responses quite quickly um, awesome. and I think people, a lot of people have voted for one answer and then have spotted the bonus all of the above answer so I think at this point most people have gone for all of the above so that's a mixture of reducing uh, the mosquito population, better infrastructure, using insecticides and discovering new drugs as a combination. That's exactly right. Um... It really depends on, on what the area is. So, for example, the reason, Cambridge is, for those of you, so, and a lot of you are from Cambridge, you'll know that we uh, Cambridge is on a, on a marshland. There's a lot of marsh, lots of fens, and it's ideal breeding ground for mosquitoes. So a lot of malaria elimination, particularly in Cambridge, was like draining water uh, because uh, mosquitoes like, uh, like water to uh, develop their own in their own life cycles. So a combination of all these things led to a lot of malaria elimination in the world, but it's not quite finished um, and we still actually use most of these um, these ways of eliminating malaria today so one of the examples is by using insecticides uh, these are often sprayed on the walls of houses and um, make sure that the mosquitoes you know can't can't bite people um, and uh, are sort of barred from other people's houses then we've got um, bed nets that were treated that are treated with long-lasting insecticides. They've played a really big part. Um, there's lots of charities that work to distribute bed nets, um, and you might have donated to these yourself. They're particularly important for young children whose immune systems are still developing, and they're very much at risk of malaria. So they sleep under these, stops the mosquitoes biting, um, and keeps them safe. And then lots of drugs, um, of course, not just drug drugs, but anti-malarial drugs, lots of them have been developed. And um, a really great story is um, that during the Vietnam War, there was a huge effort to discover anti-malarials in China. And a scientist named Tu Yu Yu discovered these ancient texts that were over 2000 years old um, that described the use of this plant um, in treating fever. Now this plant is called Artemisia and it turns out that it produces a chemical called Artemisinin and it's ama an amazing anti-malarial, it's really potent. And Tu Yu Yu was actually the first human volunteer to be treated with the blood. She knowingly got herself infected with malaria, took the drug and, and um, proved that it, that it was a very good anti-malarial and didn't have that many side effects in, in humans. And, and she won the Nobel Prize for this work in 2015. Um, and she's still doing work today. So she's very inspiring. Um, so medicine these days tends to include artemisinin and usually another drug um, in combination. So... That's how we're trying to treat malaria, but it hasn't all completely gone. Um, and that's because parasites are not all the same. Just like us, they have genetic variation and they have different um, genomes, which means that they have uh, different instructions. We're very similar because they're all the same species, just like we are all the same species. Similar, but slightly different genomes, slightly different alterations in their DNA. So for example, if we take this little parasite, this little blue guy, um, it might have a change in its DNA, a mutation, and that might make it resistant to an anti-malarial drug like artemisinin. Um, by sequencing the DNA of malaria parasites, we can see where the parasites have this change in the DNA, and we can see if it has spread to other countries. So if we look at this green parasite, we go, hey, do you have the same mutation as this blue one? You do, Are you you're probably resistant to artemisinin. That's bad news. We need to use different drugs or we need to um, launch like huge malaria eradication in, in the area because we can't let that let those sort of parasites spread. Um, so to do this, to look at the DNA of parasites, well, you, you, need, you need the DNA from the parasites. Um, and how do you get this DNA? And so what I'm going to show you now is what I do in the lab. So I work in a lab looking after malaria parasites, plasmodium parasites. 
I don't grow them in my body, even though it is, this is the perfect environment for them, it would make me very ill. Um, so I grow them in plastic flasks, so you can see one right here, um, or in these Petri dishes, which I will show you in um, a slide or two. And now I'm going to show you how I look at my plasmodium cultures by making a blood slide. And this is a way of me looking at, looking down a microscope at my cultures and see what they're doing. I do want to warn everyone that I, I am working with blood. So if you're quite squeamish, you might want to look away or look through um, your fingers, but it's, it's not, you know, gory. It's just um, essentially a, a gloopy red liquid in a tube, but I just thought I'd warn you. Um, great, so if you look at the bottom left picture here, I've got my culture. So you can see there's a layer of blood, uh, which is the layer of red blood cells. And there's also a watery layer. Uh, the watery layer is like a growth media, which has all the nutrients the parasite needs. So I resuspend the culture and I take a little sample using a pipette. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this strange place that I'm doing my lab work. Put it in a tube. And then what I'm gonna do is centrifuge the tube. And what that essentially means is you spin it around really, really fast. And so the heavy things sink to the bottom. So you can see the red blood cells have sunk to the bottom of the tube. And I'm gonna take those red blood cells by using a pipette um, set to two microliters. Now, if there are a thousand milliliters in a liter, there are a thousand microliters in a milliliter. So it's a very small amount. I just take a little bit of blood, place it on the, on the glass slide. Hopefully you guys can see this, particularly those of you on mobile. I take another glass slide and at a 45 degree, degree angle, I just go whoop, make a little blood smear. So um, I'm gonna do it again in a second. But the point of me doing this um, is to create a nice, even single layer of red blood cells. So there's no background interference of like a big glob of cells. I just want a nice thin layer so I can look at an individual red blood cell and see what it looks like. So once that's done, I let it dry and then I take it over to the staining station. So here's the staining station. And what I do is I, I take that slide and I dip it in methanol to fix the cells. And fixing cells means that you, um, once they're dipped in methanol, it forces all the water out of the cells and it makes the membranes permeable. And that means that different molecules can enter the cells, such as dyes. Um, so once the methanol has dried off, um, I'm going to introduce a dye, which I'm going to show you now. This is Gimsa. So Gimsa stain is a stain um, that makes that stain DNA bright blue. And parasites are living creatures. They have DNA. So this um, is a stain that will make them pop under a microscope. Um, awesome. So once that's uh, staining, I'll leave that for 10, 20 minutes. And then it's time to have a look at it. So um, I take my slide and I just rinse it off with tap water. Gently, but um, the, the cell should be quite fixed to the, um, to the slide. Then you can let it air dry, or because I was filming and needed to do this quickly, you can pat it gently dry with a little towel, a little paper tissue. And now I'm going to mount the slide on the microscope. Um, and so this is a light microscope that I'm using, nothing particularly fancy. I've got um, a hundred times objective lens, and I think there's an also a, a ten times objective in the eyepiece for an overall a thousand times magnification. So I've added the immersion oil, and that just creates um, a buffer between the objective lens and the slide. And then I start counting. Um, what, what do I count, you may ask. So this is what I'm looking, looking at underneath the microscope. Um, so what you're seeing here is these um, sort of round purpley things. They are actually red blood cells and they don't have any DNA in them. Some of you might know that they don't have a nucleus. They don't have any DNA, but the parasites do. So these bright purple little, little specky things, um, they're parasites that are inside red blood cells. Um, and the, you can see the different stages. If you remember, there's like a, there's a life cycle um, in the blood. So there's a blood uh, cycle where you have the early stage parasites. We often call them ring stage because they look like rings with a big gem on them. There are these middle stages where the parasite is sort of um, uh, uh, making copies of itself and it's sort of doing a lot of metabolism. And then there's the late stage here. And you can quite clearly see all these little dark um, purple dots, um, which um, indicate all these little parasites that have been replicating. So it's made more and more copies of itself and that is, seconds away from bursting and starting the cycle anew. So I can see from this blood smear that I have 
loads of parasites. So about a third of the cells we look at here, about a third of the cells have parasites in them. Um, and from my work in the past, um, I know this, this means that my culture has a lot of DNA in it that can be harvested if, if a third of my red blood cells are actually got parasites in them. So now I'm gonna show you um, how I maintain the cultures, how I look after them so that they grow so that there's enough DNA to harvest. Um, and what you're looking at here is um, a, a flow cabinet, a safety, a safety flow cabinet. And what that is, it's, um, you may have seen one on TV, on science shows or anything, but um, uh, so you see the grid, so air, there's an air flow uh, that comes from the top down into the grid, and it's very sterile in this flow hood. So there aren't any bacteria or viruses or fungi, I clean it really well. And this just means that there aren't any weird things floating around that could contaminate my plasmodium culture. Because um, I don't want to extract DNA from a fungus, I want to extract DNA from my um, parasites. Um, yeah, so this is an Emma's eye view. I've sort of um, mounted the camera right in front of me. This does look slightly like it was filmed on a potato, and I do apologise for that. Um, but I'm going to walk you through what I do to look after my cultures, and I'm going to take one of the cultures um, as a sample to extract DNA from. So um, I start by... Oh, and these are the Petri dishes, by the way, that you can also culture your parasites in. So I start by using a vacuum to remove the media from the culture. So that's the watery layer that sits on top of the red blood cells. So I remove the media from the culture because that's old media. They've used up all the nutrients in it and I have to give them some nice fresh media. Here, I'm going to take the culture from the top left well, this one here, um, and I'm going to move it to a tube. Um, because that's what I want to extract the DNA from because the parasites are super high in that well, there's, a lot, there's lots of them. And you can see here that the, the, the red blood cells form kind of a layer on the bottom and I'm just going up and down with my stripette um, just to dislodge them and making sure that I, I, I take all that culture up. I also leave a little bit of culture behind because what I'm going to do is I'm going to supplement that well with more blood and more media uh, and so the small amount of parasites that are left, they can continue to um, do their life cycle and invade fresh cells. And I can, I can keep that culture going. So now I'm gonna add media to all my cultures. Media is essentially just a tasty broth um, that the parasites need. So um, you guys at school might be learning about um, essential molecules like glucose, vitamins, amino acids, lipids, that's all in the media. Um, it's exactly what the parasite needs, but what they also need is blood. Um, so we get um, red blood cells from the NHS that, are you, that have been donated to us for research purposes um, and we take that, I'm taking a little bit of the blood here and I add it back to that culture that I took the, uh, the, the sample from. So they've got the blood, they've got the media, um, I give them a little, a little uh, shake just to resuspend them, making sure the blood is nice and even on the bottom of those Petri dishes. All done, that's how I look after my cultures and then I take them and I place them in an incubator. The incubator is at 37 degrees because the blood stage of the parasite is within a human body, which is 37 degrees. So they're quite happy in there. And I just I check on them every couple of days. Um, great, so this tube that I've just taken, um, as, in, as indicated by this cartoon here, has a parasite culture in it. And what I want to do is extract DNA from it. And I want to ask you guys whether any of you have extracted DNA before. So I'm thinking there's so some, um, so yeah, the pop-up has come up. Um, yeah, so there's a, a really common one with using strawberries. You get strawberries and soap and salt and you smash them up. Um, I was wondering if any of you have done that. We've got quite a split group. So I think we've got about 60% that have, uh, a few that might have, but aren't really sure. Like they can't really remember what, what, yeah. what exactly it was. Um, and about 30% that haven't. So more have than haven't, but there's a, a decent chunk of people that haven't, um, haven't done that before. Well, if you ever if you get bored, you've got a spare second. If you go on um, the public engagement website, there is a, a little protocol for you to do that with some strawberries, I believe. Um, but um, all it is is, smashing up the, the cells of these, of, um, of strawberries, or in my case of parasites, and um, uh, extracting the DNA. So I essentially do, those of you who have done this before, that's essentially what I do in a slightly more scientific and refined manner. Um, and I, so I end up with this tube, which has um, some uh, DNA um, in, in water, or um, yes, you know, essentially in water. And then I send that off to the sequencing team and they sequence that DNA. 
Um, so that result, they put they, um, that, some of you may have attended a talk before done by Kim Judge, who was talking to you about, about genome sequencing. Um, but those of you that haven't, it essentially reads the DNA in that tube like a book. But instead of, you know, letters like um, uh, that we're used to, um, the letters that come out of those G machines are made up of A, T, G, and C, and it's just let long, long lines of A, T, Gs, and Cs. And then it's over to Frank, and I'll, I'll, I'll pass over to Frank in a minute, to, and he's going to show you what he does with those files of sequences. So uh, this is loads and loads of people who've been involved in, in malaria work in, at Sanger, um, people who work on the computers, uh, doing bioinformatics, people like me work in the lab, people in, who go out into the field to collect different um, types of malaria from different people. And I just want to finish by saying I'm really happy to take any questions. I don't know if we're doing them now or at the end. Um, and also to recommend this book, which um, is very accessible. It's not very scientific. It's written by a non-scientist. Um, it's, it's really interesting about the history of malaria. Awesome. Thanks. Shall I stop yeah. sharing my screen? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Oh, I just turned my video off. That's uh, not a good start. <laughs> Awesome. Um, thank you very much, Emma. We do have some questions coming in, but um, a lot of them are sort of general malaria and work related. So I'm going to pass over to Frank and then I think we'll come to combined Q&A the, at the end, if that's all right. Um, so if anyone's got questions for either Emma or Frank, we'll answer most of those at the end. Um, but for now, I'll pass over to Frank, if you're ready, Frank. Thanks, Em. I am. Uh, yeah, I've been frantically typing away there. There, there are lots and lots of questions. Uh, thanks, guys. That's uh, that's great. Having these things really nice and interactive is is great. Um, we can't see each other, but at least that way we can interact. So keep them coming. Um, I haven't quite uh, managed to answer all of them. Um, there's a lot of them, and there's a few that definitely need Emma's attention because. Uh, She's more of a malaria scientist uh, than, than I am. So what do I actually do? Um, I said in the beginning that I'm a bioinformatician and that means I am not actually in the lab. I used to be, so when I was young in the olden days, um, I was in the lab holding a pipette and uh, doing all the, the experiments in the lab. I'm not doing that anymore. My lab looks a little bit different. Let me show you what my lab is like if I share my screen with you. Um, that's sort of my lab. Um, I hope you, you don't see the few other videos of all of us in, on my screen now as well. No, we can just see your desktop oh, okay, full of great. what looks like scary mind. looking code. Yeah, so scary looking. <laughs> uh, it's not meant to be scary. It's not scary at all. It's very, very, very simple. I mean, if you look at it, it's just, it's kind of plain English. I mean, come on. Um, if that, then that, else do that. So that's what my lab looks like. Um, I write code. So I started doing that. And let, let me just stop sharing for, for a second. I'll go back to it. I started doing that. Um, about, was it now 15 years ago, but but more than 15 years ago, so yeah, it tells you my age. Um, when suddenly a lot changed in biology. So these days in biology is all about big data. We can generate lots and lots and lots of data. Um, and that's because we have a lot of new techniques that have become available to us in the last 10, 20 years or so, yeah. Uh, the Sanger Institute was originally built, as, as you heard, to, to sequence parts of the human genome, actually just one chromosome of the human genome. And the, the Human Genome Project took like 15 years originally to, to complete. Uh, these days, we sequence a human genome, well, several of them, on a single little chip um, on one machine overnight. You know, it takes a couple of hours to run depending on which machine you're using, um, and then a couple of hours for the analysis. So it's a matter of you know, a day or so to actually get uh, human genome data. Um, so that was unthinkable when, when I started, when I was doing my, my PhD, um, that wasn't possible. And then all of a sudden, it changed very, very quickly. And these, these new machines came became available that um, did this sort of what was originally called massive parallel sequencing. So instead of getting 10 sequences back, which is what we were used to at the time, 
we suddenly got back something like 50,000 or so, which in today's money sounds like nothing. It's that's, that, that's ridiculously few. But back then we were completely overwhelmed. So we were sitting there in the lab thinking, so what are we gonna do with this now? So before we had maybe, you know, a dozen sequences or so. Maybe if you really, really worked hard, you got a hundred. So what you could do is you could, you could sort of manually process them. So often you were interested in things like, I've got a little sequence, um, where does this match to in the genome? Uh, what, what is this even? What am I looking at? Yeah, you could be interested in what's the organism. Maybe you don't know what the organism is and you want to identify it. So you have to match it up to genomes. You have to match it up to the data that's already in public databases, okay? Um, and that's easy if you've got you know, one or two of them, right? You just search them. Um, but if you're sitting on 50,000, then that's no good anymore. You can't do it. So um, at that point, um, a lot of us decided to become bioinformaticians to learn how to program. Um, there's a lot of people who have dabbled a little bit in coding in their teenage years, like, you know, hopefully many of you are doing, if you're doing that, you're doing the right thing, keep going. Um, so that was my story as well. Uh, as a teenager, I had a computer that you probably would laugh about if you would see it these days. Um, uh, it didn't have a color screen and the data was saved on tape. Um, so that, that's, that's the te technology back then. And it, I taught myself programming. Then I never touched it again. So I, I just studied biology, not bioinformatics or anything like that. But then it, it became useful later on as this technology evolved and we we're sitting on these piles of data. I then taught myself again to program with sort of more modern programming, uh, programming techniques and, uh, and that turned me into the bioinformatician I am now. Um, so I showed you some, some uh, of my work already and uh, I wanna show you some more um, because I think it's really cool. At least I think so. Um, let me just uh, share my screen again. So here is hopefully my screen. Can we all see that? See my screen? Yeah, great. So what you're looking at here is called a terminal window or a command line environment. And I, don't, I don't know if, is there anybody here? Put it in the chat if you've uh, experienced this already. Have you got experience with the command line? You worked on Linux before, maybe? Um, if not... We've got, we've got one question asking uh, what coding language you use. So I'm guessing yeah. at least a few people are, are, are fairly familiar with what you're doing. Oh, oh here's, here's the $100,000 question. What coding language is this? <laughs> Does anybody know? If you've, you've recognized the language, then uh, I'll, uh, I don't know. I'll send you a prize. <laughs> Doesn't, doesn't look like anybody knows. No, and I would be surprised if you did. It's, uh, it's a language called Perl. And there's a bit of a funny story with that. Um, uh, programming languages come and go in sort of fashion waves. Uh, the current fashion is Python. So if you're doing anything in Python or if you want to learn programming, absolutely go for Python. That's what everybody does now. Um, 15 years ago, especially in bioinformatics, it was Perl. Um, it doesn't really matter. That's, that's the most important thing I want to tell you. If you're interested in programming, don't, don't fret about which language should I learn or you know, these things. They're not important. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. This is Perl. Uh, Python code will look very, very similar. And in fact, I'm now working in Python. I'm, I'm currently doing my first project in Python. And I, I have to teach myself all the, you know, the, the Python uh, specifics, but it's, it's not that hard. It's if you, you, you know one language, you, you, you know, uh, you will be able to learn another. It, it, it really isn't a big, big deal. But I wanted to show you something else. Um, so this is the command line environment. This happens to be on a Linux machine. Um, if you think you've never touched Linux, um, well, if you've got an Android device in your pocket, then you have. Android is actually um, a Linux flavor. So what Google has done is basically using a Linux uh, kernel and build on top of it. Um, if you have a, uh, a Mac uh, laptop or desktop at home, then um, at the bottom of that sits Unix. Or So if there's uh, the, the Apple 
uh, operating systems built on something called OpenBSD, which is basically Unix. So there, there you are. Um, and in in uh, your Apple laptop on your desktop, you will find something called a terminal as well. So if you open it, it looks exactly like this. So Linux is also the, the operating system that uh, kind of drives the internet. So most of the web servers out there are on Linux and most of the uh, high throughput computing um, uh, uh, environments like we have at Sanger, we have lots of thousands and thousands of computers all hooked up, to, all linked, um, so we can use them as a supercomputer. Those are all Linux. You would not want to do this in something like Windows because it would be prohibitively expensive. And also Linux and Unix in general is built as a networking uh, environment right from the start, so it's ideal for that. But let me show you something cool. I promise you something cool. You're going to see something cool. Um, I am on... Uh, my in my uh, terminal here. I am actually in my living room in Norwich. Um, but uh, what you're looking at is a terminal on a server in Cambridge on a, at the uh, the Sanger Institute. Um, so uh, just going to look at some files there. So I've got a lot of files in there, and I just wanted let's let's just uh, look at one of these files. What are these? Okay, let's look at the file. So what I've got here. Looks like this. So what could that possibly be? First one to put in the chat what we're looking at. Get surprised. No, you don't. In the first answer said genome, second was DNA, and third was malaria genome. So uh, some excellent <laughs> guesses. <laughs> I wonder, though, if uh, what Emma has uh, been talking about has, 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 has made you recognize that this is malaria. If not, if you just looked at that sequence and said, well, that's obviously chromosome, I don't even know, 14, I think it was, of uh, the <laughs> malaria parasite, Plasmodium falciparum. Um, yeah, great. Well done. Um, so we, then you don't need a computer at all. Um, it's, 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 you know, it's chromosome 10. So you know, if you thought it was chromosome 14, you were wrong. Uh, yeah, this is what the genome data actually looks like, right? And I still, although I've been working with this for you know, such a long time now, years and years, I am still getting goosebumps when I open a file like that and think, this is the blueprint of a living organism. And I've got it on my computer. I can just browse this. I can go through this and look at it, the very blueprint of how a living organism is put together. It's all there. The, the, the whole instructions for, for this organism is all here in this file, in a just plain text file on my computer. I mean, if that's not cool, I don't know what is. Um, and I can use this to like search for certain things like, oh, I'm searching for a certain, look, I'm, I'm searching for a pattern. I'm searching for the sequence. Maybe I know that the sequence, this, this little pattern here is of some importance. I can search it and say, oh yeah, oh, that's where it is. So I can do things with this, interesting things. But you know, at some point the command line um, is, is not enough and you need to write programs. So um, Emma has talked about how we uh, trace malaria parasites, we, we insert little barcodes. It's kind of like what you see here, short sequences that we know are there and we know what they belong to. So like we, we change a parasite to have a certain mutation and then we put a barcode somewhere else where we can say, if you've got that barcode, you are the one with that mutation. We put another mutation in another line, put another barcode in there. You've got that barcode, then you've got that mutation. So we can now trace it. So we just sequence them and you can then, we can then say, well, you are the one with that mutation and you are the one with that mutation because we can see that barcode. And that's exactly, you know, it's like this. You can see, oh, here's the barcode, no, 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 the highlighted ones. There they are. Um, so that's great. So that allows us to trace the fate of these barcoded mutant lines in a living organism. So we can, uh, uh, we can do that even all the way through mosquito and back into, uh, you know, if we work with a model organism like... Uh, uh, Plasmodium bergia, you will know what that is. It's a different Plasmodium species that infects uh, rats and mice. So we can work with that, take it through the whole life cycle. You can't do that with a, with a human one. You have to use cell cultures, but with that, you can take it through the actual host and then trace it and see where, where, where they are and how well they've fared. So you can then do things like let them run off against each other, do different mutations and see what, what wins in the end. Is, are they both equally successful or is one dropping out? 
Yeah, you can answer lots of interesting questions with that. But I wanted to use. I have, do I have a bit bit more time, or is that am I coming to the end? Uh, we've probably got about uh, four more minutes before we'll sort of. Yeah, okay, great. I'll use those four minutes to talk about something entirely different, because right now. I'm actually um, on what's called a secondment, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of on loan to another organization. And at that organization, I work with something entirely different. And what you're looking at here is a, is a cool little web tool. I do seminars and workshops on this as well. At, uh, we'll put in some more in the future where we teach you how to actually use this. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into it today. I just wanted to show you. It's another way of uh, showing some, obviously, sequence data, right? More DNA, okay? Lots of A's and T's and G's and C's. Um, so what are we looking at here? There's this, uh, let me tell you, this is an entire genome of something. And here you see the, uh, on the left-hand side, you see the actual sequence. On the right-hand side, you see an overview of the sequence. It's the entire genome, yeah? And it says it's about 30,000 bases long. What could that be? What could I possibly be working on right now? 30,000 bases long. It's the entire genome. Anybody in the chat? Guess what? And there is. was one guess earlier that uh, that was previous, that there was guessed for the last one, but uh, for this one. Uh, yeah, in the chat, a couple of people have got it. Um, so yeah. We got one for coronavirus, one for COVID, one for yeah SARS-CoV-2. Um, I think I think you've given them some good hints there, Frank. <laughs> I think yeah, yeah, you got it. So either you guys are again amazing at de detecting uh, genomes, and you just said, oh wow, is that secret? Yeah, I know what that is. That's SARS-CoV-2. Um, or you just guessed it. I mean, it's easy to guess, right? Um, so yes, it is. By the way, it is not the genome of COVID or COVID-19. That's the COVID-19 is the name given to the disease. The disease is caused by a virus that is called SARS-CoV-2, okay? So just to get that, that terminology right. Um, that's what we're looking at, uh, the, the whole 30,000 bases of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And again, it gives me goosebumps looking at this to think that the, the thing that is currently all keeping us locked indoors, here is its blueprint. It is right there. We've got the whole thing right here. And we had it about two weeks after the outbreak in China. The, sequen the, the genome was sequenced. And we keep sequencing it. It's, I think this is it's amazing. Just 10 years ago, nobody would have believed we would have been in, uh, you know, or we would be capable of doing this. And now we can do it. Technology has evolved so much. It's amazing. Um, so what I do there, I, I work with uh, Public Health England. And so if you're outside the UK, um, this is an organization that uh, uh, sort of sits under the umbrella of the uh, Department for Health and Social Care. So it's a government organization for um, well, public health, obviously. Um, and I'm part of the COG UK Consortium, which is a, a group of a lot of people and a, uh, I don't know how many <laughs> hundreds of people are involved and a lot of different laboratories all working together um, to sequence the virus. And why do we keep doing that? Well, um, we sequence it so we can trace all these different variants. So unless you've been hiding under a rock, you will have heard of all these uh, variants that have evolved lately. Um, there is a public website that you can you can just search for for this microreact uh, where you can look at the data. If you search microreact and Quag UK or something, you will find it. Um, and you can here you can actually look at uh, maps of you know, distribution of uh, uh, of the different uh, variants and a timeline. So down here, I've got to take this zoom monitor away. Down here you can see a timeline of uh, the viral, viral variants. Um, so the bar chart here shows the dominance of certain variants. And the green one here is the, uh, this new variant that um, you've probably been hearing about a lot that originated somewhere in Kent, probably, uh, B117. And you can see how it's sort of taking over the, the, the population. And we can only know this if we sequence. So um, to trace uh, variants of a virus like this, or you know any other uh, pathogen really, um, you have to do sequencing and you have to do a lot of it. So the UK is doing a lot of sequencing these days about 
half of all genomes of SARS-CoV-2 deposited in public uh, databases now come from the UK. So it's a massive operation. Um, it's it, 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 just the infrastructure for that is mind blowing. It's, it's, it's quite complicated to set it all up and get all these people to work together. Um, so my little part in this is I have to bring data together because Public Health England as a health uh, uh, agency, we have access to uh, patient data, which is important to, to analyze for uh, in the response to the disease. But of course, that data cannot be made publicly available. You don't want to see your personal data in the public domain, right? So um, we get the data from the consortium, the, uh, the sequence data, and then we have to match it up and link it up to the, the patient data uh, so that analysis can be performed without letting that data come into the public domain. Um, so that's, you know, there's all these little bits and pieces. This is just somebody like me just sitting there writing scripts, right, programming to get these things matching up. And, and, you know, then there's other people who do, you know, lots of other jobs and there's lots of people in the labs who just, you know, pipette in, in hand have to actually uh, run the experiments. It's uh, the tests are, are PCR, if you've heard about this, uh, hopefully these days everybody knows what a PCR is. Um, and then when it, once the test is positive, it gets forwarded to another organization, uh, a lot of them to the Sanger Institute, where I'm, I'm originally work uh, from, um, for, for the sequencing. So it's, it, it, there's, uh, we've uh, sequenced over 100,000 of these now. It's, it's a uh, massive, massive operation. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what keeps me busy these days. Um, just on, do you have a minute or am I over already? You can do one more minute and then we'll switch. Yeah, one more minute. Okay. Just as a, uh, the last little bit, I just wanted to, um, to talk a little bit about how to get into something like this. I'm, I'm, I'm often asked, how do you, how do you get into, um, into the bioinformatics? Now, um, you can study it, of course. There are lots of places where you can study bioinformatics. I haven't done that, as I, as, as I've told you. Um, and probably most people I know in, in this sort of career path, um, haven't actually studied bioinformatics, but this is something you, you do later. So lots of people study biology, start out in the lab, and then discover that they actually would really like to do some, you know, informatics data analysis, programming, and things like that. So that's quite possible. So you don't have to study this right away. But I would definitely recommend that whatever you do, if you go into any science, um, do a little bit of programming. It will do you much good good later because it's needed everywhere now. Um, there's there's very few things you can do these days without programming. Um, you've probably seen this Scratch. Um, at least in the UK, this is um, uh, part of the uh, national curriculum now that you you learn a little bit of Scratch coding. So this is a way of learning coding with uh, nice sort of graphic blocks that you can move around so it doesn't look quite as scary as the code I showed you originally. Um, it's a really good way of, of getting into coding. Uh, I would recommend, and the, as the next step, if you're looking for a next step, do this. Um, there are these micro or nano computers around, like the Microbit, for example, or the Arduino and things like that. Um, here is a website where you can uh, program the Microbit and you can start with these blocks so it looks like scratch and it's really easy to do but then when you're ready for it you can switch it over to javascript and you see what's actually in the background and you can take it from there and develop your own code and hopefully then eventually you will be interested enough in this to learn something like python to program you know, to do proper programming um, and i think that's do that on the side and have an interest a sort of you know healthy interest in science and that that's i, I would say is the best career path into bioinformatics. And I think with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop. Awesome, thanks very much, Frank. Um, it was really cool to see both sides of the research from the wet lab all the way through to the sort of data side. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions. We've got quite a few questions coming in. So if you do have uh, any more questions, pop them in the Q&A um, or the chat if you can't find the Q&A. Um, Emma, I've got one for you because I think Frank touched a little bit um, on sort of his career path. So there was a couple of questions asking sort of how did you get um, from sort of A-levels or, or that age um, to the position that you're in now? If you can do a very speedy run through of your career to date? <laughs> awesome. Yep, speedy run through. Okay, so um, at A-level I did biology, maths and chemistry. 
um, and um, the grades I got were, were good enough to go to the University of Cambridge. That is a choice I made. I'm not sure if it's the right choice for everyone, but I did get into the University of Cambridge and I, I chose it because um, you could do the natural sciences degree. And this degree is very broad because I didn't want to narrow myself down too much. So I chose that degree because you get to pick and choose. You're like, oh, I'll do a bit of physiology. I'll do a bit of chemistry, maybe a bit of physics. Um, and you narrow down as you go through the years. So I, I narrowed down actually into plant sciences. Um, I just answered a question actually, I really like algae, single celled algae, phytoplankton. They're just really cute in my opinion, <laughs> even though they're just little blobs, but they're bright green and they're really cute. Um, and then I had the opportunity to work on toxoplasma, which some of you may have heard of. It is a parasite and it's related to algae. So I was like, okay, it's related to algae. So I did for my biochemistry master's degree, I worked with toxoplasma. And then plasmodium parasites are a cousin of toxoplasma parasites. And so I sort of went algae, toxoplasma, plasmodium, this makes sense. And I also feel, you know, I'm helping the world by working on malaria. Um, so I was a research assistant after university for a bit. And then I applied for the PhD program and was very lucky to be awarded a place. So that's my very quick career summary. Awesome. Um, we had a couple of questions about like, uh whether the malaria parasite is bad for the mosquito or whether it's like good for the mosquito and how come, you know, how come it stays in the mosquito for so long and the mosquito doesn't manage to get rid of it. I don't know if either or both of you can chip in on that one. I'll leave that to him. You leave that to me. <laughs> I was like, Frank. Um, so uh, I have, I answered some of these questions. Um, they're not, it's not my expertise, but actually there was a PhD student um, at Sanger who was actually looking at this. He was looking at the mosquito immune system. So mosquitoes do have an immune system. It's not as sophisticated as ours, um, but it is activated when they get infected with parasites. They, they don't actually like being infected with plasmodium parasites either. Um, and different, so there are actually many different species of mosquito that are able to transmit malaria and some are able to transmit it better than others, basically based on how well they're able to fight off the plasmodium uh, infection. And actually that's also one of the reasons why we don't really have malaria in Europe, uh, in uh, Russia, uh, North America, because um, the, our native mosquito species are not actually that good at transmitting malaria. So it's just lucky, really lucky. And of course, all the other things we did. That's really interesting. I didn't, yeah, I didn't realize that it was down to different, uh, different mosquito types. Um, a sort of follow up question that I think, yeah, might lead on quite nicely from that is how is climate change impacting where we find malaria if that changes where the mosquitoes sort of can be? Yes. Um, Yes, it, it is essentially. You might have heard actually quite recently that there was like a, a, a malaria outbreak in Spain or Italy that ne it hadn't been seen in like a hundred years and people were like, oh my gosh, malaria is like coming to coming to Europe. And, and that is because as the temperatures um, get warmer, the mosquito species that are able to transmit malaria quite well, they, they need nice warm countries, nice humid uh, and warm environments. And so as the world um, gets warmer, the um, the north and the south of the globe becomes becomes more available for them to to persist and, and uh, transmit malaria so it could be a problem that hopefully not but it could it could return so Leah, let's hope it doesn't um another another reason why we should uh, yeah, definitely uh, combat climate change um two sort of very similar questions then um emma this might be for you again i'll try and get a frank question next time um but why can't other animals spread malaria or do any other organisms spread, spread malaria um there's there's not a lot of evidence that um so um many um animals um particularly those where malaria first emerged in Africa can be infected with malaria. There's reptile malaria, there's bird malaria, monkey malaria, um, rat malaria, mouse malaria, or, which is actually what we use quite often in the lab because um, it's, it's, you're not really allowed to infect humans with malaria and do experiments on them, but in a proper controlled way, you can do it with mice. Um, so they have, a, the, they have their own species. So the worst malaria that we can get is called Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium, Plasmodium falciparum. And for example, the rodent malaria is called Plasmodium bergi, bergi. Um, so, and you, if I injected per Plasmodium bergi into my blood, it wouldn't do anything because it's just not quite adapted um, and vice versa, I think. Um, there, there was some 
evidence or, or people might have thought that certain animals like cattle could act as like a reservoir like if, if mosquitoes like put the human malaria in the cattle or you know by mistake just as they're drinking blood maybe they could be picked up again but it hasn't really been there's not a lot of evidence for that so it is unfortunately just person to person uh, transfer by a mosquito Awesome, thanks for that. Uh, Frank, did you want to answer the question around, uh, I've seen on the, in the Q and A's, is that you're gonna answer this live? Do you want time to answer that live? Yes, uh, which one was that again? Um, so it's how, uh, how do SARS-CoV-2 PCR tests detect the virus, oh, yeah. even though there are variants in the viral genome? Yeah, there's, uh, uh, we, we literally do a whole workshop on that. Um, so I can't go into all the details, but, um, so the way to detect it um, is this PCR test. And PCR works by having short strands of, of DNA molecules that are designed to attach by the base pairing, uh, A to D, G, uh, A to T, G to C base pairing and attach, we call that anneal, they anneal to the, to the, to the template DNA. Um, and so you design them so that they attach specifically to specific uh, regions in that uh, in that genome, um, and because they are around you know twenty or so bases long, uh, they can deal with mutations that you know change maybe maybe one base somewhere in the middle that doesn't really affect them. Um, so they will still work. But having said that, let me uh, no I don't I won't share my screen because it takes too long. Um, but the the way we detect one of these variants, the, the variant that's, that I showed you, that, that's, that the Kent variant, the B117, that's becoming so dominant, um, it's, uh, it can be detected by the PCR test alone. So we don't actually need to go all the way down to the sequencing before we know that it's, the, it's that variant, because there is a variation in one of the genes, the S gene, and it causes the PCR test to fail in, in that gene. So you, usually you do several primer pairs, uh, yeah, and these things that are new to, to the DNA. You do several of them, and then uh, you see all of them come up, and it's positive, and you see, okay, this is the virus. Uh, what you see with the, with the Kent variant is that um, one of them, the S gene uh, primer pair, drops out. It's called the S gene target failure. Um, and by that alone, we can tell that it's most likely the variant. You then don't know exactly what other mutations it has. And um, this is the only mutation so far that, that actually caused parts of the test to fail. None of the others would fail. So for example, uh, you know, there's, there's, lo well, there's lots of other mutations around that wouldn't be picked up in the, in the test, but that one is. It's quite useful actually to us. Excellent. And there's one question that I think uh, wraps up our session quite nicely. So there's a question that I think might go to both of you um, that says, what is the next major hurdle that science is trying to tackle in the battle against malaria? So I think that's quite a nice future thinking question to wrap up on. Um, who wants to go first? <laughs> it's going to be a vaccine, right? <laughs> it is, yeah. Well, so wait, the, ma the major problem or the major... The next, the next big like aim that the science has in aim. order to get rid of malaria. Yeah, yeah, vaccine. Let's do it. Um, I did mention this um, in another question and answer, and I have a longer talk which explains va vaccinating against malaria is really difficult because, well, so not to bring it back to coronavirus, but we all know the coronavirus is covered in 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 this protein called the spike protein. It's just got well, it has a how many Frank? Do you know how many proteins it has on the outside of the viral shell? It's just the spike protein. Is it just the spike protein? So um, your oh, immune system. I mean, yeah. Okay. The, the, okay. We might be wrong. We're not experts in coronavirus, okay. but um, essentially, it either has one or very few proteins on its outside, which the immune system can recognize. And of course, we don't want the spike protein to mutate too much because it could be that our immune system won't recognize it a second time if it mutates, etc. For Plasmodium, um, because it's more, it's a, it's not a virus. It's a um, it's a whole single celled organism. It's actually a protist. It's actually related to algae. Um, it is absolutely covered in proteins, lots of different proteins. And even worse, it does like a smoke screen thing. It can change the proteins on the top. So it sticks out one protein and the immune system goes, aha, I will destroy everything that is, has that protein. And the parasite will hide that protein and put a different one up. And then the immune system doesn't recognize it. And essentially the immune system is constantly racing against uh against the plasma and the plasmodium parasite 
And the plasmodium has about 60 different versions of this coat, this like smoke screen. Um, so we either need to produce a vaccine with 60 targets or give 60 different vaccine vaccinations and it's, it's complicated, but maybe. If I may add to that, so that it, the similarity again to the, to the coronavirus or any virus, influenza, yeah, flu, uh, same problem. Um, we have, uh, there is a vaccine, of course, but there's different variations of it. And every year you kind of have to guess what's going to be the predominant uh, flu strain that's going to come through this, this year. So you have to vaccinate against that. Um, and it's the same thing. It's, it's the, the, the virus changes what's on the surface. Why is that so important? Because these surface proteins are the interface between the pathogen, the virus or malaria, uh, parasite, whatever, to get in to interact with the human cells. So the virus needs to attach to um, uh, to a receptor on on the human cells, like in your in your nose and your in your throat. Um, there's this it's called the ACE receptor. It's a protein sitting on 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 your cells. Virus has a protein that can actually attach to it, bang, uh, like magnets, and that's how it gets in. If it can't attach, it can't get in. That's what you, uh, one of the things you do with a vaccine, uh, not only do you target, uh, or uh, no, you prime your immune system to, to attack this virus, you also cover that uh, Im all important protein that all sits on the, on the surface with something else. So it can't actually interact, it's like a buffer between, can't interact with it anymore. And that's always the same thing, that's always, uh, with malaria, we want to do this. We want to target something that sits on the on the surface and makes it uh, attached to the red blood cells. You want to target that, prevent that. Everything else is not going to work because it's not exposed. The immune system cannot see it. You, it, it's pointless. Yeah, you want to target something that is is, ex, is exposed, and you want to target something that enables it to get into your cells. If it can't get into your cells, it's harmless. Excellent. I think that's a perfect uh, place to wrap up. Thank you very much to both of our speakers. Um, if you have any sort of further questions that we didn't have time for today, um, I'm going to pop our email address in the description at the bottom. Um, there's been a couple of questions about the recording. It'll be put on YouTube in the next few days and then it'll be linked onto our uh, web page. And I will again put all the links for that in the in the description as well. Um, so if you want to watch it back or if you've got uh, any sort of teacher friends or student friends that might want to watch it, um, they can uh, obviously catch up there as well i'll pop those in the description just now but thank you very much for everyone uh, for coming along and hopefully we'll see a lot of you next week thanks all